our HPHT diamonds grow, uh, we're pressure cooking graphite into diamond. Uh, the growth cell is filled with small diamond seeds at the bottom of the cell, catalytic metal material is put in, then the graphite, this donor source of carbon, uh, and then a gasket is applied on top of that. This growth cell is then put at the center of a hydraulic press where you have six different anvil, anvils coming in on six sides of a cube, which is why it's called a cubic press. And that growth cell is pressurized to about a million PSI and about 1500 degrees Celsius. Uh, I can't show you what's happening within the growth cell because you can't put a camera in something that high of pressure, um, but that graphite is heated to the point where it melts, turns into liquid carbon, and a convection is created where that liquid carbon is convected by the diamond seeds and atom by atom, uh, diamonds grow out of those seeds. So after the growth uh, cycle, the uh, animals are removed. Uh, this growth cycle, uh, excuse me, this uh, is broken open and we will see that the uh, diamonds are grown on top of the seeds in a cubo-octahedral shape. So here we have the seeds with which the diamonds are grown. This is upside down, so you have the seeds on top, and the cubo-octahedral uh, crystals are then grown on top of that. So HPHD's got a lot going for it. Um, it's got low to zero crystal strain, which results in a really transparent, bright white material. And it's very well suited for melee, those accent diamonds and fashion jewelry. Uh, so what are the cons of HPHD? Uh, it takes a specialized facility. Each one of those uh, reactors, or excuse me, each one of those presses is about 70 tons. So the thickness of the concrete to just have those machines is substantial. Uh, you have less control over the process because you're not able to observe the process given the conditions of diamond growth. And it's less efficient than CBD growth. You can't grow as many diamonds at the same time. HPHC is certainly prone to some unique colors. Um, and we do have these diamonds here today. We're going to just go ahead and dive right in on BGP. So the first is B, which stands for blue. Blue tinge in HPHC is very, very common. It is due to trace boron that is added during the growth process to compensate for present nitrogen. Um, measurable levels of boron is known as type 2B, and about 75% of HPHG diamonds that GIA sees are considered type 2B. Um, type 2B diamonds are more likely to have a blue tinge, but they may not necessarily have a blue tinge, and we have an example of that later. And while there certainly exists blue tinge natural diamonds out there, type 2B natural diamonds, they're exceptionally rare. They make up 0.1% of the gemstone market, um, and they fetch much higher prices per carat than blue tinge laboratory grown diamonds. So when we talk about um, laboratory grown diamonds with boron defects having a blue tinge, um, that does not mean that you might personally like or dislike a blue tinge, but it is considered a crystal defect. So why does the blue happen? Uh, well, nitrogen is all around us, and it is impossible to get nitrogen out of an HPHT growth cell. So it's packed in between the little granules of graphite. It can be a defect within the metal. And so you have to add boron to compensate for that nitrogen. Uh, unfortunately, boron does not uniformly adhere into a diamond crystal. So it actually goes to different areas of the crystal, whereas nitrogen goes uniform throughout the crystal. So you have to overcompensate to ensure that you don't have brown diamonds. And if you overshoot it, you end up with blue diamonds, like this diamond on the bottom. Yep, so both of these on the left-hand side are HPHD grown F color. So here's an atomic model of that compensation. We've discussed that with CBD, so I won't go deeper into that. But I do want to show at the bottom here that we have in the back row, those golden yellow diamonds are what HPHD diamonds look like if you're not trying to keep the boron, sorry, the nitrogen out of the crystal. The white diamonds are ones where that ratio is correct. And the blue diamonds in the foreground is what happens when you have too much boron. As I mentioned, this can be done in different zoning. So here we have different uh, zones within uh, the crystal. 
and different boron concentrations, so some areas of white, some areas of blue. Uh, here's a look that GIA did at an, a large HPHG grower and found very different quantities of boron across their different diamonds. Um, so this is on a spectrum. It's not that some growers produce with boron and some don't. Uh, it can vary diamond by diamond. So here's another case study um, that we have. This is a greenish tinge pear. And you can see that this is two completely different growth sectors. So you see a, a sort of darker section uh, right here, and that's where you're having nitrogen concentration. And then you've got the lighter section sort of surrounding it, and that's a boron concentration. So literally like from elementary school, when you combine yellowy plus blue, you get green. Um, and that's really what has happened here with this stone. Um, what's interesting to note is this is a type 2B stone, but because of the nitrogen concentration being in a separate growth sector, it turned green. Um, and to be clear, this is not green enough to be a fancy color diamond. This just looks a little off. This actually received an I color grade. So the second of our BGP um, is G is for gray. And gray in HPHT has many causes to it. Um, it could simply be that what you're seeing is a blue tinge. It just might look a little gray to you in certain lights or in certain environments. Gray could be from irradiation, um, and it could become from other elements such as added aluminum, titanium, other trace metals, metallic inclusions. The exact formulas that keep nitrogen out of an HPHT press, those are very <laughs> tightly guarded trade secrets. <laughs> so the reason that we don't necessarily know why a diamond might have a gray tinge is frankly by design. This is a case study of a gray tinge stone that we sent to GI researchers for their analysis. Um, really, really interesting one. Uh, we were all effectively stumped. I think that the, all that we could really come up with from looking at the stone under diamond view is that uh, you might be able to see that there are these streaks uh, in the crystal, almost look like claw marks, and they're fairly uniform. Uh, so the thought process here is that this diamond likely has growth tubes, and that's what giving it this gray tinge. It's honestly one of the ugliest diamonds I've ever seen. It's so cool, and we have it if you want to see it afterwards. <laughs> And finally, um, the P of BGP is for phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is a orange or blue glow seen in a lab diamond after exposure to long wave light, sunlight, or full spectrum light. Uh, phosphorescence is not the same thing as fluorescence. Phosphorescence is due to boron, um, but it's not necessarily only seen in blue tinge. So I'm gonna touch on that a little bit more in a second. Um, phosphorescence can make a diamond look kind of hazy or milky in low light environments. It can last for a few seconds or several minutes. Um, and for today, we're only speaking about phosphorescence under long wave light. We're not talking about short wave light. Short wave light is filtered by our atmosphere. Um, it's a special gemological tool. It's not something you should mess with at home. It's a bit dangerous. So again, we're only focusing on long wave phosphorescence, not short wave phosphorescence. So you see here I have four HPHT diamonds. Um, one on the left is blue, one on the left is yellow, one on the right is blue, one on the right is yellow um, in terms of their tinge. And um, these are about to get some phosphorescence testing. So what I did is I removed them from the paper tray and I moved them to a perforated tray. This is in our office in San Francisco. And what I'm gonna do is expose it to a handheld long wave UV light. You can buy it on Amazon for five bucks. And I'm only gonna show this for about a few seconds. Um, I'm gonna turn off the UV light. And now watch what happens when I turn off the light in the office. So the diamond on the far left, so it had a blue tinge, you can see a fairly strong phosphorescence. Uh, that yellowy diamond on the left um, had what we call moderate phosphorescence. It's a little bit hard to see on this monitor, but um, the phosphorescence is not even throughout the stone, right? Because the boron's not even. Remember, we're thinking about zoning and growth sectors. The same phenomenon happens um, with lab diamonds that uh, have phosphorescence. And if you recall on the right, there was a blue tinge and a yellowy tinge HPHT stone as well. The blue tinge HPHT stone, completely inert, right? So just because it has a blue tinge does not mean it's going to phosphoresce. And as you can see from the yellowy tinge, emerald cut, doesn't necessarily mean that um, it won't phosphorus. So what I did here is I came back to the room an hour later and I turned off the light and they glowed again. And I thought that was strange. 
And I realized that this is not prolonged phosphorescence that goes on for hours and hours and hours. I left the light on in the office. Um, that's just a normal office light. That's not a handheld UV light. That's not sunlight. Um, so the phosphorescence was actually activated by just normal fluorescent light bulbs that we had in our office that had just enough full spectrum that it activated the phosphorescence. So you don't need anything special to see phosphorescence, um, just darkness. So what should consumers know about phosphorescence? Well, it's not the same thing as fluorescence. It's an important indicator because fluorescence does appear on grading reports and phosphorescence does not. It can only be tested for in person. And it, there's no definitive connection to color tinge. So as we said, you can have blue or yellowy tinge HPHT that may or may not phosphoresce. 